Roger Earl, Foghead, founding member right here, the drummer king of Foghat, slow ride. <laughs> I just want to make love to you. Fool for the city. What is up? Stone Blue. Um, actually, I'm not a king. I'm an earl of the cheap royalty. Uh, don't, don't want to be a king. They have to work too hard. Earls, they're knighted from somebody from a thousand years ago. The House of Lords, what a bunch of crap that is. Oh, I, don't, well, I don't live there anymore, so I shouldn't really complain. I'm living in the land of the free, home of the brave, and the home of music. Music comes from America. We still we give music to the world, this country. Blues, jazz, bebop, rock and roll, country, gospel music. You know, this is the land of music right here. And even to this day, we still give it out to the world. Um, everybody listens to this land when it comes to music. I don't want to talk about the other stuff. Where are you living at? America. No, uh, somewhere in America. Uh, <laughs> Long, I Long, I Long Island, New York is my home. Uh, we have a studio down in Deland, Florida, where we recorded our last album, Sonic Mojo. And, um, yeah, it's a beautiful day here out on the island. I might even be able to get a walk in today. Excellent. Uh, actually, I went to the gym yesterday, so it felt good. I got to tell you, my uh, I'm 57, so I grew up in the uh, height of full blown fog hat. You know, <laughs> so did I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. 1971 fog hat starts. You leave yeah. Savoy Brown with Lonesome Dave. You guys fire it up, and uh, you get the the cover of Willie Dixon's. I just want to make love to you, and you're off to the races. Full 70s rock. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know, sounding rock and roll, but I like it, like it. Yes, I do. Uh, that's another another English band. Actually, we're uh, three quarters of American at the moment. Actually, no, I'm an American. Um, I just talk a little funny. But this is my home. Um, I love this country and uh, all the music that it's made over the years. It inspired me as a little kid living in southwest London. I said, I want to go to America. And here I am. Thank you. Who was it that got you on the drums? Was it, uh, you know, Zeppelin, Bonzo, or is it way before that? Is it Ringo? Who is it? No, way before that. Um, Jerry D. Lewis. I went, my dad played a piano a little bit, somewhat in the style of Fat Swallow, you know, Honeysuckle Rose. Uh, and um, he brought home a single one day. He used to work at Aston Martins at their old plant in Feltham, which is about two miles from where I grew up in Hounslow, southwest London. And uh, he played, uh, he bought a Jerry Lee Lewis single, Great Balls of Fire. The B-side was Mean Woman Blues. And he said, oh, yeah, have a listen to this son, boy. He can really play the Joanna. And uh, about two months later, Dad took me and uh, my best friend, Dave Hutchins, who was a bass player. I was about 11 or 12 years old to see Jerry Lee Lewis in southwest London. And I was never the same. Uh, and my mother said it addled my brain. I'm not sure what an addled brain was. But I knew I wanted to be involved in music. I knew that's what I wanted to do. My older brother played piano. His name's Colin. He was four years older than me. And he helped by bringing home uh, all the music from uh, Sun Record Company, early Elvis Presley, Jerry D. Lewis, Johnny Cash. I'm a Johnny Cash fan. What can I tell you? Uh, I was 12, 13 years old, riding my bike, and I'd be singing Johnny Cash songs. Nobody in my school knew who Johnny Cash was. I did. Uh, you know what I loved about Johnny Cash? His songs, it was always a story. There was always to rhythm, great rhythm, even though he didn't have a drummer. But his early stuff on Sun Records was like rhythm. And there was a story. I didn't even know what the stories were all about back then, 12 years old. What do you know about? Ah, oh, the water, Papa. Repeat, I'm rising. I had no idea what that meant. Or uh, uh, I won't sing Johnny Cash songs. I won't do them justice. Anyway, enough to say I'm a Johnny Cash fan. So Johnny Cash, you're getting into uh, American rock and roll. And then the Beatles hit, of course. At what point do you get a drum kit? And why drums? Why not guitar or piano or bass or anything? What drew you to that? Actually, I did start playing the piano at first. I can play a 12-bar somewhat in the key of C. Um, my brother played piano. He's four years older than me. My dad played piano. 
And apart from that, drums are louder. Actually, as growing up, even before I even knew I wanted to be a musician, there was always music in our house. Mum and Dad, the radio, the record player. We had a Grundig tape player that we record stuff off the radio. Uh, there was always music. And uh, I wanted to I wanted to be in I, – I loved songs and music. I just gravitated to the drums because I was always banging on the good china with knives and forks. Uh, lampshades were a symbol. Mum used to call me, the noisy sod is always banging on something. <laughs> I love, I, actually, I had fantastic parents. We, we weren't rich by any stretch, but never went hungry. And they always encouraged me in anything I wanted to do, whether it was like running or whether it was like in music. And, um, you know, uh, I play I play drums in a great rock and roll band. Unbelievable, man. Like you've been playing your whole life, which is just incredible. Once you get the drum kit and everything, how fast does it really start to happen for you? Like Savoy Brown, because Savoy Brown's one of those bands that was around during the late 60s, 70s, but never really seemed to hit it. But they would always be that opener for like Ted Nugent or ACDC when they came through, you know? Nothing wrong with ACDC. Great rock and roll band. <laughs> um, actually, I got my first drum kit when I was 15. I'd been taking drum lessons for about three years. I used to work after school three nights a week and Saturday mornings in a bakery. And in Saturday afternoons, I'd take drum lessons. So I joined my first band when I was 16, maybe 17, with uh, three guys that I used to go to school with. Ray, Ray Dorsett was the lead singer. My best friend was Dave, the bass player. He got me in the band. And then uh, I started playing drums, got my first audition with um, Savoy Brown when I was 19. Uh, didn't pass the audition the first time. Uh, they called me back a couple of months later because the drummer that they had couldn't play a shuffle. Can't join a booze band if you can't play a shuffle. <laughs> uh, and um, off I went. Whoa, sound like a bomb just went off outside. Wow, that was crazy. Where, where are you? I'm in Los Angeles. That was nuts. Wait, could, well, uh, earthquake? No, it was a sonic boom, man. Like, you can't believe. Like, I mean, oh, really? my dog barked. <laughs> 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 the, sh the show must go on. Yeah, it could be hell going on right outside my yeah, door. You know, uh, I remember one time I was out in L.A. Uh, this is in the mid-'80s. In fact, I was playing at... Uh, down south in San Juan Capistrano, where we just did a show. And I'm sitting in this restaurant, all of a sudden, bang, I thought a truck had hit it. And and the waitress goes, earthquake, and carries on like, earthquake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're in L.A., you're going to either get earthquakes or, you know, uh, some kind of craziness, and you get used to it over the years, you know? Actually, I always um, – I've always enjoyed myself. Um, I lived there briefly. There was a young lady I was going out with. Actually, she was older than me. Other than that, um, I've always enjoyed going there. The audiences have always been fantastic. We just did our record release party at the uh, Coach House in San Juan Capistrano. We had we played eight songs from our album, the new album, Sonic Mojo, and the people were just fantastic. So, uh, yeah, no, I always enjoyed playing in L.A. And this, um, what was it, last Friday? Uh, it was fantastic at the coach house. We had a great time. People were fantastic. Oh, I'll have, I'll have fun in a box. I might find it out one day. I love, I love that you've just been playing your whole life, you know, because throughout the fog hat history, of course, people, it's interesting to think people would retire. Like we toured too much. I retire. And then they would come back like five years later and get back into fog hat and then retire again. You know, you're like, no, I, ne I never quit. Um, you know, I remember in 1984, Lonesome Dave decided to move back to England. I didn't. I carried on playing. Um, you don't replace somebody like Lonesome Dave, but, you know, we needed a singer. Um, but, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's tough. I've been fortunate. The good Lord hasn't seen fit to take me just yet, and I'm grateful for that. I'm one of those fortunate few in this world that uh, gets to earn a living doing something I love. And... You know, I played drums in a great rock and roll band. I mean, it doesn't get a lot better than that. Well, it might do for some, but for me, I like what I do. 
I know it's only rock and roll, but I like it. I keep singing Rolling Stones songs. Have you heard the Rolling Stones new album? I tell you what, it's fantastic, man. It's fantastic. It's great. Your new record sounds great, man. I was digging into it right there. Uh, Thank you. A little bit of everything, driving on. I don't appreciate you. Uh, you know, still going on and on. Now, when you play, say, out on the road now, you said you just played the Coach House and you played eight songs. And then, of course, you've you've got to play the big, big hits um, that were all, you know, came about, I would say, in the 70s. Right. That the formula was, and it was like an unexpected formula, became the live album, Kiss Alive 1. Peter Frampton comes alive, Fog Hat Live, ACDC, If You Want Blood, uh, all the live records. Isn't that interesting that it was a live format that really exploded uh, the bands? They could have three, four records out and then really hit. Uh, with us, actually, the, the Fall for the City album was probably um, the biggest selling album, but all our records went gold or platinum. I mean, I don't keep up with that stuff anymore. But I remember doing the live album. Uh, Rod and Dave, who were uh, the main writers in the band, I think we're struggling a little bit because we've been making uh, we, by that time we'd had like seven hour albums out or something like that. And uh, I was listening to every night after we played, my sound engineer, Bob Coffey, would give me a cassette. Cassettes, that's how long ago it was. Um, and I just to check on the, you know, make sure the tempos were cool and everything was like working right. Because back then in the 70s, it was yeah, youthful experience, youthful energy, youthful. Oh, we, we were youthful. Anyway, um, and it was out, the band was sounding great. And I was the one who suggested that we do a live album. And Nick Jameson, our longtime producer and friend, also bass player on the Call for the City album, uh, produced it. And um, yeah, it was a good record. Uh, there's only 25 minutes or 30 minutes of music on there, I think six songs. Um, we were, I know we were playing for about at least an hour and a half at the time. So there's another hour of uh, music hidden in. Um, Warner Brothers vaults out in LA. I wanted to go down and see them one time and, and, and pull it out so, so we could have another live album from the 70s. And they said, we can't go down there. And I said, well, why not? They said, nobody goes down there. I said, exactly. Maybe you should let me go down there and find it. And they said, sorry. What? Yeah, I don't know. Warner Brothers corporate. Let me ask you about that. It was it was only a six uh, uh, six song record. It's really technically kind of an EP. Uh, 38 minutes, you know, back then, because people were doing double live albums and everything. What was the decision on that? Was it Warner Brothers to try to keep it cheap? Like, nah, we're just going to put out these hits and get it out there. What was that? I've got no idea. Um, I wasn't in charge then. <laughs> Not that I'm in charge now. I have a fantastic manager. She's great. She does everything, takes care of everything, makes sure everything works. Um, I don't know. I think it was probably Warner Brothers. Um, uh, like I said, there's at least another hour of music um that we were doing then. And um it would be fantastic if they decided to find it in the vaults on one condition that Nick Jameson mixes it and produces it. Well he produced all the stuff. We there was probably three or four, maybe five or six shows that we did recording at that time. And those songs came from two shows from um, York, Rochester and Syracuse. Now, here's my question on that, because over the years, you know, you realize a lot of the uh, the bands I've had on here, they've said, well, it's not really a live album. We recorded some of the tracks, then we overdubbed or the vocals were off or the sound was weird that night. Is it an actual authentic live record? Yeah, of course it is. Um, we, maybe, maybe, uh, there was a couple of vocals we had to do parts of because the mic went out or something. Maybe Dave bumped into it. Uh, no, it's a live record. Um, we can play. Uh, in fact, we've had numerous live records out over the years. There was some from radio recordings that we did. We'd play live in the studio on a radio. They put that out. That was, um, uh, I forget who that was. There's been a couple of times. Actually, since um lonesome day passed 20 what 21 22 years ago we've had four studio albums out and four live albums uh so <laughs> it's uh no we can play you know we cut our teeth like in 
small clubs in in uh, uh, London when I was growing up, and Savoy Brown, of course. So now we can play. Oh, I know you can play. I was just saying, you know, some sometimes things happen. They go, oh, the the mobile truck didn't capture this. The audience isn't loud enough. We put some. Uh, I mean, there's uh, words of Kiss having Super Bowl, you know, thirteen or whatever as the the audience, you know, to beef it up. There were all kinds of tricks to have this killer live record. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure Nick Jameson probably did a couple of tricks with whatever, but he is, uh, you know, a brilliant um, producer and engineer, a uh, brilliant musician as well. Do you hate people like that? This, this person, Nick Jameson, can play, plays everything. Plays every instrument under the sun. You know, he picks up a new instrument like an accordion or an oboe. And in ten minutes, he's playing it. Do you hate people like that? It's crazy, man. When they when they're good at everything, yeah. And us mere mortals have to struggle all our lives to master one instrument, or at least learn to play it well. I remember being in the sixth grade, maybe seventh. I would go to the roller rink, the the roller skating rink, and they had a a time uh, each night when you could skate as fast as you wanted. It was called speed skate. Okay. And they would put on slow ride. And me and my buddy, Mark Garderman, would hit the skating rink and just fly, man. And whenever I hear that song on the radio, which is daily, which is daily, I hear fun yeah. every day on the radio, which is awesome. I just go back to that skating rink and me just trucking along, man, you know? You know, that, but that's part of the beauty of music, uh, I think. Um, it reminds you of times of moments in time. In fact, playing music, when you write a song or you play a song and you record it and go, all right, that's it, and you mix it and stuff, it, it, they're all, music is like a moment in time. Uh, I mean, Foghat is famous for sort of, uh, well, for us anyway, for jamming. You know, we, we'll do a four-minute song in the studio. Uh, next time we play it on stage, it's like seven minutes. Because every, when you're playing, um, you, it's, as Lonesome Dave used to say, do we have permission to jam? Yes. Yeah. Jamming's the, what made Foghat so great. And a lot of those bands right there, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area and a big part of my uh, uh, life that changed my life is the Day on the Greens by Bill Graham. And you headlined one in 1979. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. Uh, I love Bill Graham. Yeah. I thought I think he was one of the most incredible promoters, certainly in my lifetime. Because we used to play at the Fillmore East when I was in Savoy Brown, played the Fillmore West. Bill Graham would always come into our dressing room and, and he'd say, everything okay, guys? Everything, you know. And uh, back then we used to have our instruments in the dressing room and we'd jam before we go on stage, warming up. And Bill Graham was quoted as saying, I think Foghat likes to sort of play music more than they like to breathe. Bill Graham was was truly a great producer impresario he would have i mean i remember one time we played in uh, new york we had um uh albert king and the uh, and uh, the the voices of harlem choir and savoy brown uh we would play uh with buddy rich's big band or an eight-piece band and and somebody else and do a show with bb king and and what, what was really cool was he would mix all sorts of music. So you got a taste of stuff you might never hear. And that I, it was something that won't happen today, won't happen. Maybe because of people, maybe because uh, promoters can't work like that. And it, maybe it wouldn't work like that. But um, back then, Bill Graham was, uh, was an absolute master of putting three or four acts together. And uh, I love the man. And I think... Um, is he in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Uh, he better be. He better be. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're right. That guy would do, he would do a show. It'd be Cheech and Chong, Miles Davis, yeah. and Zeppelin. You know what I mean? And it'd be, and people were there for the ride, man. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, Bill Graham was um, uh, a rare man amongst men and a, a great promoter. And uh, yeah, uh, I love the man. He was really cool. Tell me about that day on the green. It was you, Fog Hat, Gamma, which is, of course, Ronnie Montrose's band after Montrose. 
uh, and you guys headlined, and it was 1979, when, and that was the peak of his, uh, you know, uh, stadium concerts, which was, you know, Dan the Greens. Yeah, it was um, it was great. In fact, um, I became good friends with uh, Ronnie Montrose, and also when he had Montrose, we did a whole bunch of tours with Montrose, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was fantastic. It sounded great. The people were great. Um, San Francisco. No, is it not San Francisco? Across the bay. Yeah, across the bay. San Francisco, like, uh, I love my heart. Stop it, Roger. Um, no, it's the Bay Area, right? Um, yeah, it's a beautiful part of the world, actually. I mean, shows are shows. I mean, uh, I can't ever remember not having, not enjoying a show. Um, I, re- I really can't. I can't. You know, somebody said, you ever had a bad show? I don't remember. There is sometimes maybe something would go wrong, but, you know, like a, an amp would blow up or fall over. Oh, yeah, we had that on the ship one time. We did a, a cruise about seven or eight years ago. It was really windy. Two Marshall stacks fell over on stage. Oh, we were up on the deck. Yeah, that was fun. Um, Day on the Green. Uh, another great Bill Graham show. I remember going to see uh, the Who, the Cow Palace, I think. Oh yeah, with the with uh, the uh, with the horse tranquilizer. Yes, and uh, Keith. The other night, Keith fell over. Yeah, Dave, Dave and I went there. I think it was we had a day off, and last of Dave and I went to see. I was always a fan of the Who. Used to see him when they were around London in the uh, Eating Club and. Uh, marquee and stuff like that and uh, they started playing but you couldn't hear keith moon and Mooney was like flailing away i looked like he was flailing away on the drums he was sort of doing this couldn't hear him and after and i think it was a quadrophenia or something and it really sounded bad and dave and i said oh, it wasn't it wasn't very good so we left. And then that was afterwards I heard that Pete then asked if somebody could come up and play drums. That was my big chance. Oh, man. That would have been crazy. You would have been there. Uh, but um, I did, uh, over the years, I, I played a couple of times with uh, The Who. Um, when I was in Savoy Brown, we did a, uh, played a ballroom down on the South Coast. It was during their Pictures of Lily tour. That was the drum kit that Keith that Mooney had and um Savoy Brown had finished setting up in front and I was sitting there like fiddling with something and Keith Moon came in in a big parcel under his arm and he went up to his he, we said hello and then he started putting cymbals up on his cymbal stands and he says yeah you want one he gave me a cymbal with moon sweat on it there was nothing wrong with it no cracks or anything it was just dirty and he gave uh, and he, he carried on around his drum kit had a couple of and an 18, a 20 inch crash, and then they gave me a 22 inch ride cymbal. This is when I was earning 12 pounds 50 a week when I was in Savoy Brown, which was probably about 20 bucks a week in 1969, 1970, something like that. And uh, Mooney just gave me probably a thousand dollars worth of cymbals or a thousand pounds worth of cymbals. He endeared himself to me that day. Um, I got up and played with them three or four times, uh, three times. Uh, Magic bus. That was I get up and play the floor, one of the floor tom toms and the cymbal, and then Mooney would like kick the drums over. That was time to depart. <laughs> Didn't want to get involved in any of that sort of nonsense. That was purely Who. Actually, the Who were probably one of the greatest bands ever come to come out of London. I used to go and see them at the Ealing Club regularly, and uh, they were fantastic. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Sonic Mojo, Foghat's new album. <laughs> Let me ask you a little bit about the, uh, you were talking about Johnny Cash earlier, and we all know uh, Rick Rubin, you know, went in and refired up Johnny Cash's career late in his life. And he also came to you guys in 1993 to uh, possibly do a record together. Can you talk to me about that? I had no real knowledge of that. Um, uh, David got moved back to England in 1984. He came back in 1991, put a band together. Uh, manager at the time, um, 
was in charge of that. It didn't happen. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, maybe Rick Rubin was busy with, I know he did Johnny Cash's album. I think he did a record with uh, Mick Jagger. Uh, I don't know. I had no knowledge of that. I'm not in, I'm still not in charge now, but I have knowledge of what's going on with this band. <laughs> uh, back then it was like, I was just glad we got the original band back together and David cut returned from England to, uh, start playing again. Uh, that was when we did the return of the boogeyman album. We are, we, uh, our manager is in the process of, um, looking at re-releasing their on folk records, of course. Um, so, uh, that was, actually, it was a really good record. I'm, I was really pleased with a bunch of the stuff on there. Actually, Nick Jamieson once again was the engineer. There we are. Yeah, I don't think you can find it anywhere at the moment, but we're going to re-release that. Let's talk about uh, Charlie Hunt. He came in, and he is fantastic. I saw him in 1978 with Ted Nugent, and I was so young, I thought it was Derek St. Holmes. And then years later, I realized – Oh, that wasn't Derek. It was Charlie Hunt. And he is unreal and uh, just a killer, killer singer. Now, once you get him, he retired in 22. But uh, how did that go about? How did you get him? Did you just call him up? Well, what happened was uh, Lonesome Dave passed. And I a number of people had sent me uh, tapes and CDs. Not tapes. It was actually tapes back then. And um, I wanted to take a break just to try and figure out what I was going to do. But I uh, I done it, did a show with uh, when Charlie was singing for Humble Pie in um, Toledo, Ohio. And Dave was alive and we were headlining and they were opening up for us. So, uh, but Dave and I were good friends with the folks in uh, Humble Pie. Stevie Marriott was probably one of the greatest singers to ever come out of England. We did tons of tours with him, and I love Stevie. We would hang out a lot of the times. He was dangerous to hang out with, actually. Oh, wow. I would often end up on the one, uh, one with the carpet. Anyway, it's another story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, um, Charlie Hewn is singing with um, Humble Pie. Now, they started off, didn't sound all that good. Um, the drummer was playing, but it just didn't sound very good. And Dave and I were standing at the stage because we wanted to check out this guy who was singing our mate Stevie Marriott's tunes. And Charlie started singing. I said, whoa, this guy's got a voice. And after Dave passed, um, I talked to our road manager, Mike, at the time. I said, Mike, you think you could find uh, that singer who sang with uh, Humble Pie? He said, yeah. I said, um, you know, let me know like if you get in touch with him. Yeah. That was Mike. So. Uh, he got in touch with Charlie. I talked to him. I asked him if he was interested in singing with the band. He was still doing some dates with uh, Humble Pie. And uh, I sent him about 20 or 30 folk hat tunes. And I remember at the time, my girlfriend said, you think that's rather a lot of songs? I said, if he wants to be in the band, he'll learn them. Charlie called me up about two months later and said, I got it. Uh, he came to my house out here in Long Island. Actually, it's a houseboat. It's not very big. But his home, and uh, he it sounded like Humble Pie had joined Foghat, which I thought was really cool at the time. It was it was rather sad to note when Charlie decided to leave. I think it was probably because he just his voice. You know, it's hard to sing in that range that Foghat does it, and certainly Humble Pie's range. And um, you know, I know if we do like a couple of days in a row, it would be he would struggle, and then traveling and. On the road can like wear you down. I think he had, he was having some problems with his uh, hips because he was an avid downhill skier. The weird part about it was he sent an email to our manager three days before we were supposed to get uh, start rehearsing for the tour, January, I think, and um, said that he was retiring and he wouldn't be at rehearsals, which is kind of weird. And then he put it on his Facebook that he was leaving Foghat and we had like dates a week from there. So that was like um, dealing, dealing with a nightmare. And I haven't heard from him since. Wow. If you hear from Charlie, tell him to give me a call. We, we played together for 20 years and like not a peep doesn't talk to me. Doesn't talk to anybody. I don't think or um, Rodney or Brian. It's kind of weird. Um, it is weird. 
Yeah. I, I, I talk to my mates, even the ones that have passed on. <laughs> I do. No, I, I, I do. In fact, I had a word with an old friend of mine, uh, Billy Davis, this morning, who passed on a number of years back. He was a good friend and sang with me when I had a band. And uh, I, I talked to him t- today and uh, started working on a song. Let me ask you, uh, being a drummer, uh, I've had many, many drummers on, and I've played music a, a long time in my life. Was there uh, bad record deals or, you know, drummers get cut out of money and stuff? What was it like for you being in Fog Hat? Record deals? No, the record deals were fine. Um, no problem. It was our first manager. It was a thieving scumbag. Oh, shit. Sure. Uh, no, uh our first record deal, publishing deal, was um, the the writer would get. Uh, you have like a hundred percent of publishing. The writer would get fifty percent, and the other fifty percent would be split up between the writers. Also, the record company would take a, a percentage of that. But then, about about the middle of uh, seventy something, seventy six, seventy seven. Um, for some reason, I wasn't paying attention. I was just happy, sort of doing what I was doing. Our manager uh, took me out of it. Um, he's no longer our manager. He's a very he's an ugly, unhappy human being, and um, I'm still here. I'm still playing in a rock and roll band. I'm having the time of my life. I play with a great band. Scott Holt joined us two years ago, but I've known him since 2014. He is an incredible musician and a great bandmate. Uh, Brian Bassett, our longtime sly guitar player and producer and engineer, he's actually played in Fog Hat for nearly 27 years now. Lonesome Dave introduced him to us. Wow. Um, uh, Rodney O'Quinn, our bass player, has been with us for seven years. We stole him from the Pat Travers band. I actually called up Pat and said, Is it all right if we steal your bass player? And he said, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't think he was working at the time, so right. thank you. And, uh, no, we're a band. Uh, we do – well, actually, this year we've probably got twice as many song, uh, uh, dates already lined up as we normally have – what is it, November now? Yes, uh, we do like 60, 70 shows a year. Um, yeah, it's – life is great. <laughs> Sonic Mojo, the new record, it's really got a ZZ Top feel to me. You know, I listen to it from top to bottom and it has like a, a, it has a fog hat essence, but it definitely has some ZZ Top flavor in there. Well, ZZ Top's just a little old blues band from Texas. I mean, the blues is uh, the basis for every form of music that's come out, as far as I'm concerned. The blues got uh, jazz and then jazz got bebop and bebop got rock and roll. I mean, America's land of music. And we've been uh, influenced by the blues and rock and roll ever since I was this, and the same with everybody else in this band. Let me read you something. Yep. Sonic Mojo. Sonic, a frequency within the audibility range of the human ear of waves and vibrations. All right. Mojo, a noun, a charm or amulet thought to have magic powers. Do you think there's magic in music? I know there's magic in music. <laughs> oh, it's kept me alive. Yeah, same, same here. Uh, you know, when I was Stone Blue, rock and roll helped me through. Let's talk about uh, your drum kit. What are you playing these days? Uh, sonar, Pearl, Tama, what do you play? There's only one drum kit to play, DW, Drum Workshop. Made in America for Americans. They let limeys and other people use them too. Uh, DW drums are handmade by people who are fastidious about how they're finished and made. Um, I use DWs all the time. Some, uh, most of the time I, um, I bring my snare drum, my pedals, the DW pedals, of course, and uh, cymbals on the road. And I get a DW kit to my specs. And actually, it doesn't really matter what size they are. They sound great. If anybody gets a chance to go to a drum workshop, out in California and uh, to visit the place. And it's absolutely incredible what they do. And I use pasty symbols, though they're not made in America, they're made in Switzerland. And there's nothing wrong with the Swiss. Um, also, a number of 
great drummers over the years have used them. Actually, cymbals are fascinating because every make of cymbal, out be Georgians or Sabians or, or some of the other cymbals makers that are out there, they all have a di- very distinct sound. One of the great things, for me anyway, about pasty cymbals is that, you know, if I break like a dark crash, an 18-inch dark crash, uh, they'll send me another one, and it sounds just like the one that was broken but new. If I got a 22-inch custom ride that cracked, which I did, it, I kept it. I just didn't want to give it up because they had put the Foghat logo on it, but it was beat to shit. It was cracked all over. I got a new one just before we played uh, our two uh, show, uh, release party shows. It sounded just like the other one I had. That is the beauty of pasty cymbals. Now, other cymbal makers are, are fantastic sounding cymbals, but they vary. So the real cool thing is to go to the cymbal company and say, I need to try them out. Um, pasty cymbals, I just reorder or to let them know that I've broken one. Or I say, do you have anything new out there? And they go, yeah, we've got one of these, Rod. you want to try it? And I go, yeah. Um, you know, I am so fortunate with the cymbals that I use and the drums that I use. Uh, they take really good care of me. When I'm out on the road, if I have an issue with something, I get what I need so that I can perform at the, the very best of my ability. DW drums and pasty cymbals. I endorse them. Oh, and uh, Promark drumsticks. They let the woodchopper have a ball. Oh, man. I love DW. My buddy uh, Dave Elitz just uh, designed a new snare for them, and it just came out last week. And they're yeah. great. They're out there in Ventura, California. You know, Bozio, when I was young, he was like the first guy I knew that was playing the DWs, you know. And, yeah, they they kill it, man. DW is fantastic. They, 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 are, they, they are a fantastic instrument. And what's really, really interesting, they they – really really you know redefined the art of making drums they really have um they can make it you know a, 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 when you have let's say it's a wooden drum and and the drum has a note with a, a timbre when you hit it mm, you'll get that and they put it inside each of the drums if it's an a flat or b sharp or something like that you could they will actually or can make a drum kit for you of all the notes that you want the drums to be. I'm not that nuts about that. I mean, I can tune a drum and make it sound great. Actually, you don't have to work that hard with DWs. Just the fact that they can do that. They they have redefined the art of making drums. Can you tell that I'm a spokesman for the country, the company? <laughs> <laughs> they are the best. They are the best. I'll, I'll give you a story, a quick story. I, I was with uh, Ludwig for the longest time. Uh, Bill Ludwig is still a good friend of mine. Um, and Ludwig drums were, how did my friend Bobby Rondinelli put it? They were the sound of our youth. They were the sound of drums for the last however many years, the, you know, three generations. And um, I was fortunate enough to, to be with Ludwig drums for a while. But then they sold the company to a bunch of bean counters from Selma. And I would call up from the road like a stand would break or something. I was on the road traveling all the time. And I would get a machine. Nobody would call me back. They would never. And I'd say, all right, you know, so this, the rim got bent because the truck fell over. And I couldn't get through to anybody. Um, and I played some DW drums in up in Boston at a music store up there. And um, they were fantastic. So I, I called DW up and they said, well, why don't you come down and meet everybody? So I went down to the factory in uh, Oxnard. And... Uh, they, uh, John Good took me around the factory and like met everybody. And I'm looking, and it's like, it's like a wonderland for a drummer. I mean, I, it's like, it's the most incredible place. They even have guitar players and piano players making drums. It's that cool. <laughs> and then we went back and then we went back to the office and we were talking. And then John Good said to me, he said, uh, so why, uh, so why do you want to play DW drum, DW drums? And I said, well, they're the best. And he said, okay, make a wish list. And I've been with them ever since. And awesome. uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I, you know what? I know how fortunate I am. I'm looking at that Fool for the City gold album behind you. It's just so amazing, that record. And to see that, it's it's so cool. Do you have a lot of your stuff? This is my favorite. This is Buddy Guy. Yeah. I'm, uh, 
I was a presenter at the Blues Awards down in Memphis a couple of times. And uh, I got to present a buddy guy who is uh, just, uh, I don't, I mean, I can't say, I can't think of enough superlatives because I did see him the very first time I came over uh, to the States in 1969 when I was in Savoy Brown. And uh, I'd met him a number of times. Beautiful man. Uh, this night he won best song, best blues guitar player, best album. And my co-presenter at the time said, does Buddy Guy play piano? Probably would have won that if he played it. And uh, I'd met him a number of times because Scott Holt, our uh, lead singer and guitar player, played with Buddy Guy for 10 years, uh, taught him everything he knows. Yeah, we got some juice in this band. <laughs> That's great. Well, you got a tour coming up for 2024 to promote the new record? Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll be rocking and rolling around the country. We're... Um, you can go to foghat.com, find out where we're playing, who we're playing with, uh, all the, you can get hats and t-shirts. You can find out all things Foghat, um, and uh, we will be out there. Um, I'm going to roll till I'm old and rock till I drop. Thank you again for uh, talking about the record. Um, yeah, it was great to have you on. I'm, I'm particularly proud of this record. Uh, it was, um, I'm really, really happy with the way it turned out. And uh, uh, we'll see you folks out on the road. We'll uh, be rocking and rolling. Uh, I'm going to roll till I'm old and rock till I drop. It's so, I mean, it's such an honor to have you on, man, because Fog Hat is just, you know, it's in my head every day. And I just absolutely love 70s rock, you know, Fog Hat. Now, before we get out of here, I'm a comedian. Do you see stand up comedy at all? Are you into it? I watched um, George Carlin last night. Amazing. No, uh, he is. He is so fucking funny. I was crying with laughter. White men, they shouldn't be in blues band. They should be banned. I'm sorry I'm not black, but uh, the blues, is, as far as I'm concerned, is the quint form of music. It is, without the blues, we would have no rock and roll. We would have no jazz. We would have no bebop. So... Uh, Without all those great blues musicians that start this, uh, I would be out of work. I wouldn't have this running through my veins. I wouldn't have met Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker, um, and 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 Willie Dixon, probably one of the greatest men that ever lived. There would be no rock and roll if it wasn't for Willie Dixon and Chuck Berry as well. Well, actually, we'd all be out of work. All right, my man. Thank you so much for doing the show. It's my pleasure. Did I get it across that I'm a blues fan? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, there's another song. There's a song coming out. I know it sounded rock and roll, but I like it. I like it. Yes, I do. <laughs> That's another great record. Listen to the Stones' new album. It's great. It's fantastic. And so is it's your record. Got it. I got it on my record player as well. Thank you for, so much for doing the show. Roger Earl right there, a drummer, rock and roll legend from Fog Hat. Get the new record, see them out on tour, and do yourself a favor and go back and, and go through their catalog from 1972 to 2023 right now. They've been tearing it up. Thank you, my man. Dean, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, man. We'll see you out there. Okay. Bye. See you, buddy. Bye. Bye.